good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Praveen Karand, and it's a it's a pleasure to be uh, at this workshop and talk about uh, uh, some of the interesting work that uh, we have been doing in my lab. And uh, the title of uh, of this part of the workshop is uh, Molecular Approaches in Primatology Part Two. Part One has already uh, uh, been um, uh, already done. Uh, but here we will move more into uh, molecular uh, methods. Um, in particular, how molecular data has been used to resolve taxonomy uh, and for species delimitation. Um, we won't have time for getting into population genetics. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, when I was preparing this uh, presentation, I realized that uh, that's a whole different ball game and uh, it will need a lot of time. Uh, moreover, a lot of the work uh, on uh, Indian primates has been on molecular systematics and species delimitation. Uh, very little population genetic work has been done. So, you know, we'll just concentrate on the first part, molecular systematics and uh, species delimitation. Um, and the um, but before we get into that, I just want to quickly go over uh, how we do this kind of work. Uh, typically, this involves sample collection um, from the species of interest. Uh, in this case, you know, I did a lot of my work on langurs. I've been working on langurs for the last 25 years now. Did my PhD on, on langurs. Uh, and the kinds of samples that you can collect, obviously, uh, you have blood samples, which are uh, preferred. Um, you have tissue samples, you have hair samples. Um, you also can use fecal samples, right? And then we extract the host DNA from these samples. PCR amplify uh, the marker of interest, uh, the gene of interest, sequence the gene, uh, then you do that uh, with multiple samples, align the sequences, and you then analyze the data. You generate the phylogeny. Um, and this is what a typical sort of alignment looks like. This is a cytochrome B sequence from a whole bunch of uh, uh, langur species uh, from, uh, from India. Uh, and... Uh, I'm trying to get my uh, pointer here. There we go. Uh, and so these are the sequences and there's some variation. And basically we are interested in looking at the variation um, to build phylogenies. Um, there are two sort of broad methods of tree building. Um, I won't have the time to get into these different tree building methods. We conduct uh, uh, a phylogeny workshop every year, uh, usually first week of uh, August. Um, this year we had it much later and it was online, uh, but hopefully next year onwards we'll be back uh, to the regular uh, phylogeny workshops. We've been doing that for almost 10 years, so those of you who are interested in knowing more about molecular phylogenetics, please uh, attend that workshop. Anyway, I'll just quickly go over the, you know, different tree building methods. So once you have the alignment, you can subject that alignment to different uh, kinds of analyses. There are two broad categories of tree building methods. Uh, you have the distance space tree building methods and the ones that use the character state approach. In distance approach, the two methods that many of you might be familiar with are UPGMA and neighbor joining. In character state approach, you have maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian inference. Uh, for some reason, it, uh, here we go. Uh, so in the distance-based tree building method, what we are basically doing is we have the sequence alignment. We calculate pairwise uh, genetic distance between species and then use that um, distance matrix to then build a tree. 
So if you look at this very simple alignment here, the number of differences between human and chimp in the sequence alignment, you can actually count it up. There's one change here uh, and there's one change here. So between human and chimp, there are two changes and so on between other species pairs. Now, if you look at this distance matrix, you realize that the distance between human and chimp is the lowest. So you then start clustering species based on genetic distance. Um, what I've done here is generated a tree using UPGMA. Um, it makes certain assumptions. There are certain issues with this uh, tree building method. So if you're going to use distance based methods, use neighbor joining. But as I said, you know, we'll leave this uh, for another day. So if you're interested, take the workshop. Now, the other broad category of tree building method is called the character state approach. <clears throat> In the character state approach, you go from the sequence directly to the phylogeny. Whereas in the earlier method, what we are doing here is we are first calculating pairwise genetic distance. And this pairwise genetic distance is then used to um, build a tree. So in that sense, it is um, the, the character state approach is different because here we are going from sequence directly to the phylogeny. And people have often argued that there's no loss of information in the process and therefore it is better. Uh, but what are we doing in the character state approach? In the character state approach, each character, so each column here represents a character, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is evaluated independently and then you come up with a tree that best explains this character distribution, right? So you actually look at multiple trees and you ask yourself the question, which tree best explains the differences that you observe between sequences um, in your alignment? Um, so you actually reconstruct the evolution of each site on the tree, okay? And I'm not gonna get into the details here. Um, uh, the methods that are used in uh, character state approach include parsimony, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian. Uh, parsimony is not that popular anymore, so it's it's just Bayesian and, like, and, and um, likelihood that we see today. So now once we have this tree, the question then is, what do we do with these phylogenetic trees, right? Um, so here's where uh, I, I dive straight into the model system, the Hanuman Langurs, and we all know Hanuman, uh, and we know why these Langurs are named Hanuman Langur. Um, but to me, these Langurs are very interesting uh, because they are, you know, widely distributed species. Um, Hanuman Langurs, uh, as we have known for a very long time is widely distributed from you know the Himalayas all the way to the sea coast also in Sri Lanka uh, they are found in you know semi-arid regions of Rajasthan you know 400 meters up in the Himalayas to the the tropical uh, evergreen forests of Western Ghats and to the drier hinterland in the in the Deccan region so they're found in all kinds of habitat and it was long thought that the the Hanuman langurs are a single species with multiple subspecies uh, but it was Runewell uh, I think way back in the 70s uh, who points out that these langurs actually have two uh, morphological types, the northern type and the southern type. The northern type has its tail looping towards the head and the southern type has, has, a, has a tail that is looping away from the head. Okay, And within the distribution of, uh, of Hanuman langur, you have uh, Nilgiri langur and purple faced langur. Uh, Nilgiri langur, as you know, is found in uh, uh, the Western Ghats. Uh, the south southwest India uh, in uh, evergreen forest and uh, uh, purple faced langur in southwest Sri Lanka again in the wet zone. Um, so this is basically the distribution of all these langurs, uh, and also we have uh, two other species of langurs in India in in the northeast, 
you have the golden lungur um, in uh, uh, Assam and Bhutan, and of course you have the fairy leaf monkey, which is found uh, actually only in in Tripura. Here it's uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then you have the fairy leaf monkey over here, and then you also have uh, cat lungur, which has a much larger distribution. Now, if you look at the the classification that was widely accepted for a very long time, um, that was a classification by Oates in 1994. <clears throat> and in this classification, Hanuman langur is placed in the genus Semnopithecus, and all the other langurs of India are placed in the genus Trachypithecus, along with langurs of Southeast Asia. Right. So what do we have here? We have an interesting dichotomy where, you know, the gray area, that's Hanuman Langur. Uh, it's Semnopithecus and the rest are all Trachypithecus along with the Langurs of Southeast Asia. Right. So Nidri Langur and Purple Face Langur is also Trachypithecus. Langurs in the Northeast, Golden Langur, Cap Langur. And of course, fairy leaf monkey, all trachypithecus, but Hanuman langur is in genus Semnopithecus. Uh, so this was a widely accepted uh, classification for the longest time. And in 1994 is when I started my PhD work. Uh, and when I looked at all the classification schemes out there, you know, there are lots of them. But in most of these classification schemes, in fact, in all of them, Hanuman langur is assigned to a very distinct uh, taxonomic unit compared to all the other langurs from India as well as from Southeast Asia. Um, so the first task really was to resolve the, the phylogeny of langurs of, uh, of Asia. Now if you look at uh, the, the past classification scheme, you have an interesting uh, scenario here. So you have Hanuman langur that is assigned to genus Semnopithecus and you have uh, Nilgiri langur and purple face langur assigned to genus Trachypithecus along with all the Southeast Asian langurs, right? And uh, there are a couple of characters that unite Nilgiri langur and purple face langur with Trachypithecus from Southeast Asia uh, and, and, you know, basically they have a much darker coat color the neonate, the newly born, tends to have a very light coat color and so on. So based on that, Nilgiri langur and purple face langur were placed in the genus Trachypithecus, whereas Hanuman langur is in, um, in uh, genus Semnopithecus. Now this results in what we call disjunct distribution or discontinuity in the distribution of species currently classified in the genus Trachypithecus. Okay. So you have Trachypithecus uh, in Southwest India and in Southwest Sri Lanka. They're absent in the rest of India and then they reappear in Northeast, you know, with Cap Langur and Golden Langur. And then they, you see them in Southeast Asia. So how do you explain this disjunction? This is another very interesting question and it's in the realm of biogeography. Uh, I won't uh, talk too much about it, but uh, uh, if you look at you know, many other attacks are distant distributions are actually quite common. So you have many species in the Western Ghats uh, that are completely absent in the rest of India and then they re reappear in Northeast India and they are found throughout Southeast Asia, right? And if you look at the habitat, the Southwest uh, India, the Western Ghats, uh, it's high rainfall area, it's evergreen forest and then you again have evergreen forest in Northeast and much of Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, you see this in many other groups uh, and one of the possible reasons for this kind of distributions is uh, climate change. So in the past, we know that uh, particularly in the mid Miocene, there was something called optima uh, when much of India ha was covered in humid forest that was contiguous with forests in Southeast Asia. Uh, by late Miocene and early Pliocene, uh, things began to change. Um, 
dry zone was established in central India, which spread into South India, fragmenting the wet evergreen forests in 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 these two uh, in these two disparate regions, southwest India and northeast uh, India, and so species in these regions got isolated. Right. So if this is the 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 reason, um, if if this is um, uh, the the reason for or rather this could be the potential potential reason reason for why we see the disjunction in certain species that are adapted to wet forests um, so what would that mean that would then mean that yes indeed uh, nigri and purple faced langur are allied to southeast asian langurs and the hanuman langurs are are distinct so you are basically talking about two dispersal events into india okay so the two dispersal events would be, you know, first the Nilgiri and purple, the common ancestor of Nilgiri and purple-faced purple langurs perhaps came in from Southeast Asia when everything was, you know, forested. And with the establishment of dry zone, they got isolated uh, and Hanuman langurs that are more sort of dry adapted um, disperse later. Okay. So... Uh, then when um, uh, during my PhD, when I first uh, built the phylogeny, something very interesting emerged and that was uh, um, Nilgiri and purple faced langur was clustering with Hanuman langurs from Sri Lanka, South India and North India. They were not clustering with Southeast Asian langurs. Right? So clearly, you know, they they fall in a different taxonomic group, not not with trachypithecus. So they are they are semnopithecus. But this was this was uh, you know mitochondrial cytochrome B. Uh, since then, a lot of nuclear markers have also been uh, sequenced. But this basically this story does not change, right? So Nilgiri and purple faced langur are actually more closely related to Hanuman langur than they are to Southeast Asian langurs. So that is sort of the, the take home message here. Uh, and in fact, there was just a single um, dispersal event into India and then there was radiation uh, into many species. So all the langurs in the Indian subcontinent, I mean, except the Northeast, uh, fall in the, in the genus Semipithecus now. Okay, so, um, so in case of langurs, we see this single dispersal event. What about macaques? Macaques, the phylogeny suggests multiple dispersal events. So the species that are boxed in these uh, red boxes uh, are the ones from India and Sri Lanka. And as you can see, they are not clustering together, right? So they're in different parts of the phylogeny, thereby suggesting that there have been multiple dispersal events into India. Whereas in case of the langurs, there has been a single dispersal event because all the langurs from India, Indian subcontinent, branch together. Okay, of course, this does not include the Northeast, which actually, biogeographically, is Southeast Asia. Okay. All right, so these are, you know, this is the nuclear marker, which also shows the same pattern, the langurs of uh, peninsular India or the Indian subcontinent excluding Northeast all branched together even in the nuclear markers and in fact in many other uh, nuclear markers we see the similar pattern but there's something very interesting going on with uh, uh, golden langur and cap langur so in this phylogeny here the golden langur and cap langur branch with semnopithecus now remember Nilgiri langur and purple faced langur, which was in, in, in past put in, in trachypithecus, are in semnopithecus, right, along with Hanuman langur. So, golden and cap langur actually are sister to semnopithecus, whereas in the, in the nuclear lysozyme gene, uh, they are clustering with trachypithecus, the Southeast Asian langurs. So, what's really happening here? And if you look at the distribution of, uh, of Captain Golden Langurs, they are sandwiched between Semnopithecus and Trachypithecus. 
right? So this is sort of indicative of a hybrid origin of this lineage. We know that Cap Langur and Golden Langur are closely related, but the Cap Golden lineage, phylogenetically, its position shifts between Semnopithecus and Trachypithecus depending on the marker, right? Um, so you have Semnopithecus is one clade, Trachypithecus is one clade, Cap Langur branches with Semnopithecus in the mitochondrial and in the nuclear with Trachypithecus. So anyway, we, we suspect that uh, uh, it's hybridization and now we have more data to support it. So we think in case of the Cap and Golden Langur, it is hybridization, it's an hybrid lineage. Uh, so that's what is is summarized here. So you have Hanuman Langur, Lingri Langur, and Purple Face Langur in Semnopithecus, Fairies Leaf Monkey that's found in Tripura, in Trachypithecus this was known earlier, so that's nothing new along with all the Southeast Asian Langurs. And then you have Golden Langur and Cap Langur, you know, I put question marks, but you know, we are quite certain that it, um, the, this particular lineage um, has an hybrid origin. Okay, so um, we're talking about molecular approaches in primatology um, and there are two applications in taxonomy, right? I mean, phylogenies can also be used uh, to understand biogeography. That will be a whole different lecture. Uh, but let's just concentrate here on taxonomy. Um, so one is molecular systematics where we are looking at higher level uh, taxonomy using molecular data and basically what we find that Nilgiri and purple face language that was thought to be Trachypithecus is actually Semnopithecus. Uh, what's happened here is the characters that these species, two species share with Trachypithecus appears to have evolved convergently because they occupy um, habitats similar to Trachypithecus. Right? And in case of cap golden lineage it seems like it is uh, in hybrid lineage and probably we should assign it to a new genus. So the next part I'm going to get into how molecular data is also useful in delimiting species, particularly species uh, complexes or, or species groups that are uh, highly problematic where we don't know how many species there are. Okay, so um, Let's go on to the second part of uh, this presentation. If I can get the, yeah, there you go. Okay, so if you recall the phylogeny of uh, the Langurs of Indian subcontinent, something very interesting happens here, and that is, you know, you have purple face Langur and Nilgri Langur nested within what we are calling Hanuman Langur. Right now, if this is a different species is and this is a different species, how can we call all of these as one single species? So, um, in um, in phylogenetics, we call this situation polyphyly. So, Hanuman langurs are polyphyletic; they are not monophyletic. When you have a situation like this, it basically means that the species that you are looking at is probably a species complex and uh, uh, you know one needs to look at this group more closely so that is what uh, we did in fact if you look at Hanuman Langurs what people call Hanuman Langur today they exhibit a lot of morphological variation right um, and in the past, there have been some classification schemes that have alluded to the fact that this, uh, this uh, group consists of multiple species, but most people consider Hanuman Langur to be a single species with multiple subspecies. And this is just a whole slew of, uh, of classification schemes that have been proposed for Hanuman Langurs. So what are they? I mean, if you look at um, Pocock, you know, it's all one species with multiple subspecies. 
if you look at hill he says there are four species and each of those uh, four species have multiple spe uh, subspecies and and so on right so what's really happening here uh, so when i started this work uh, we realized that uh, um, this is a mess that needs to be resolved and molecular data is the way to do it uh, and the lack of resolution in the classification of Hanuman Langur, we believe, is due to three reasons, right? Uh, most of these classification schemes are largely based on coat color, uh, which, you know, our analysis suggested uh, is highly plastic, highly variable. Uh, often it's just informed opinion of researchers, of taxonomists, uh, rather than based on objective analyses of morphological characters uh, in a statistical framework or even uh, other kinds of characters like molecular data or behavioral data or ecological data. Uh, additionally, they are inferred from reanalyses of museum specimens. So most of these classification schemes have been reanalyses of museum specimens that were collected way back. You know, some of them as, as way back as 200 years ago. So people kept going back to the museums and, and, and you know, and coming up with all kinds of uh, classification schemes. So we decided that, look, you know, let's go back into the field and, and, and see what's happening. And let's throw in mole uh, molecular data. Let's, let's, let's look at the ecology. Let's revisit morphology, right? So what uh, what we decided to do is something called integrative taxonomy that uses multiple lines of evidence evidence to delimit species, right? Um, so the idea was to go back into the field to identify morphologically divergent group and see if these morphologically divergent groups or morphotypes are also genetically divergent, uh, you know, then look at the previous classification schemes, um, also do ecological niche modeling to see if these different clusters actually are also diverging in the ecological axis. Right? Um, these are some of the uh, characters. So we started with the, the langurs of peninsular India, uh, the ones in, in South India. Uh, and we looked at the literature and came up with a bunch of characters that people had used in the past and we said okay let's go back into the field and observe these monkeys takes photographs um, and see if we can uh, uh, find some of those uh, characters and, and and look at how these characters are distributed in the population and uh, the, these characters included uh, you know something called streak between the eye and the ear so presence and absence of streak crest on the head, tail loop, northern type and southern type. And within the southern type, there were two different types of tail loop, extent of blackness on the hand and so on, right? Uh, so we went to all these locations in, in South India, in peninsular India, and, and collected all this data. Um, and we built a neighbor joining tree. And what we found was something quite interesting. Um, the the langurs in South India fell into into two clusters, and that's from North India, right? And it corresponded very well with Hill's classification. Okay, Hill uh, was one of the few people who said that langurs in India consists of four species. Hypoleucus, Priam, and Entelus, and the one in, in the Himalayas, Cystaceus, right? So here, uh, Cystaceus has not been included. Uh, but the morphological data agreed with Hill's uh, classification. Then we said, okay, what about the molecular data? Um, so as I said, Cystaceus was not included here. Um, and the distribution data also uh, agreed with what Hill talks about in, in, his, uh, in his papers. So we were like, okay, it looks like, you know, we have at least three species. We have uh, uh, Hypoleucus here, 
Priam over here and also in Sri Lanka and Entelus. This one we had not uh, done uh, any work at that point in time. Then we looked at the molecular data. This is the mitochondrial tree. And in the mitochondrial tree, what we see is that Entelus separates out. Hyperleucus also separates out. Uh, but Priam and John I, John I remember is Nigri Langu, are interspersed in, in a clade. Right? And I'll come back to this in a little, in a little bit. And something very interesting is going on there. Uh, but essentially what we call Hanuman Langur is falling in three different clusters. Right? Of course, the Himalayan Langur is not included here. I'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, and if you look at the <clears throat> nuclear tree, all the species separate out, including Nilgiri Langur. So all of them fall in separate clusters. So you have North Indian, Samnopithecus entelus, in South India you have Hypoleucus and Priam, and then you have Nilgiri Langur in, in the uh, 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 evergreen forests. Um, and this is just another way of looking at, uh, at the nuclear data. In, in case of nuclear data, we used uh, four different nuclear markers. Uh, there's a program called Structure that actually comes up with natural groups within your genetic data and it separates out into four clusters. But there is some admixture, right? So what we are calling Hypoleucus has some genetic material from Priam. Um, so there seems to be some uh, hybridization event going on. Uh, in fact, we do know that Priam and John I, for example, hybridize. So we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit. Okay. So this is what uh, the nuclear data suggested, you know, Entelus, Hypoleucus, and Priam. It agrees with the morphological data. There is some discordance between nuclear and mitochondrial data. Uh, Priam and John I are interspersed in a, in a clade, whereas in the nuclear tree, they separate out. Uh, so what's really happening, or oh, before I come to that, uh, we also looked at uh, uh, the uh, we also looked at the ecological data. Uh, we did some uh, uh, niche modeling uh, or species uh, distribution modeling, as it's called now. And basically, all the four species separate out, right? So Entelus is confined to North India. Uh, Hypoleucus to Western Ghats, Northern Western, uh, Northern and Central Western Ghats, and into a bit of uh, the drier parts of Karnataka. Priam, largely the drier parts of Karnataka, uh, Andhra Pradesh, and Kerala, and of course, uh, Jonai or Nilgiri Langu confined to Southern Western Ghats. So these species have also diverged in the ecological axis. Um, <clears throat> so why this discordance between nuclear and mitochondrial <clears throat> data? In the mitochondrial data, you know, you see that Priam and, and John I uh, don't separate out, but in the nuclear data, you do see them separating out. Uh, by and large, though, there is some evidence of, of admixture there. But what we think is, it's, I think, because of hybridization. And there's also something called incomplete lineage sorting. Um, and I, I don't have the time to get into the details here. But basically, when you have a situation where gene divergence precedes species divergence, um, you can land up in a situation where you know um, certain gene genealogies won't agree with species trees. Um, but I think much of this discordance is probably because of hybridization. And we know there is evidence from the field that Priam and John I hybridize uh, in multiple places. And then we also found from our nuclear data that <clears throat> many of these other lineages also hybridize. So Entelus and Hypoleucus, there is some evidence of hybridization and Hypoleucus and Priam also there is some evidence of hybridization. Okay, 
So the question is, <clears throat> find these three populations. Well, let's include uh, Nilgiri Langur also. These four um, lineages have diverged in the ecological axes, have diverged in the, in the morphological axes, are also genetically different, yet they hybridize. So, you know, can we call them different species? Right. So this goes back to the whole species concept, what is a species and so on. And the most widely accepted species concept, as we know, is the biological species concept, uh, which emphasizes reproductive isolation. Yeah. But let's not forget that there are many other species concepts. I think there are like 21 or 22 different species concepts. And it's, it's a big mess. Uh, you know, there's phylogenetic species concept, there's ecological species concept. Um, so Kevin Decuras uh, in the in the late 90s came up with something he called uh, the general concept of species that tries to unify these different species concepts. Uh, so Decuras noted that the various species concepts, such as biological species concept, phonetic species concept, ecological species concept, are related to a diversity of events or sub-processes that occur during speciation and that all modern species concepts, um, species definitions are variation of the same general species concept which he calls the lineage species concept or the general concept of species. And his definition of species are species are segments of separately evolving metapopulation lineages. Okay, um, this is not really, I mean, it, it might sound very uh, uh, esoteric, but it's, it's not. So it's basically, these are, uh, these are, what, what do you mean by lineages, for example? Lineages, lineage is basically, uh, you know, um, that refers to ancestor descendant series. Um, so, you know, your last name basically defines your lineage, right? So your last name you share with your father, with your grandfather and so on. So that's a lineage. Um, and a metapopulation is basically um, uh, subpopulations that are exchanging genes. And a metapopulation lineage is basically subpopulations that can be extended way back into time where they have been extending, uh, exchanging uh, genes. So uh, basically, if you have these metapopulation lineages that are separately evolving, independent of other such metapopulation lineages, then we call them species. Okay. And uh, Kevin DeCuras goes on to say that uh, under all species concepts, a species is a separately evolving metapopulation lineage, but under the isolation version of biological species concept, they have also have to be reproductively isolated. Under the ecological concept, they have to occupy different niches. Under the phylogenetic concept, they have to be monophyletic and so on, right? So basically what he's saying is that the different species concept are talking about the same thing that species are independently or separately evolving metapopulation lineages but they are actually referring to the different sub processes that happens during speciation right um, and so the best way to identify or delimit species is to use a combination of these sub-processes or use multiple lines of evidence, what we call integrative taxonomy. Uh, and he goes on to say that presence of any one of these properties or sub-processes is evidence for existence of a species, though more properties and thus more lines of evidence are associated with, are, are associated with higher degree of corroboration. So, uh, so basically, the idea here then is that, you know, look at, 
divergence at uh, divergence along various axes you know look at morphological divergence so that would be a morpho species concept or phonetic species concept ecological divergence that would be ecological species concept reproductive isolation would be biological species concept you know genetic divergence would be phylogenetic species concept behavioral divergence uh, would be you know um, oh, i forget the species concept that uh, anyway uh, so and the idea really is that these different um, uh, though that's <clears throat> that's cohesive species concept anyway um, and the idea really is that during speciation these different sub processes occur at different times in different orders in different diverging lineages right a good species is the one that would show all the divergence along all these uh, um, uh, these axes um, but in case of recently diverged species some of these sub processes might have might not have occurred they might have diverged in the ecological axis but not in the genetic axis or in the morphological axis if you have cryptic species they might not diverge in the morphological axis at all okay so basically what we found in case of uh, the langurs was something quite interesting um, all of this was thought to be a single species hanuman langur and uh, when we use multiple lines of evidence uh, we realize they actually consists of four different species semnopithecus entelus in north india hypoleucus in southwest india uh, priam in eastern peninsular india and cestaceous in the himalayas right uh, this part of the work is actually just published uh, by kunal arekar uh, and I've actually not talked about it, but we use similar sort of uh, kinds of analyses where we use morphological data, molecular data, uh, ecological data, multiple lines of evidence, integrative, uh, integrative taxonomy, and so on. Uh, and what's interesting here is if you look at the tail carriage, right, they're different for all these different lineages. Um, the northern type, tail loops towards the head but look at the difference between entelus and cestaceous right this tail loop ends at the base of the tail whereas this one is extending to the back of uh, to the back look at the difference between these two tail loops right so just based on tail loops you can identify these species they are indeed different species <clears throat> so, the so-called Hanuman Langur is a complex of four species. By the way, this is not, not something new. Hill had already talked about it in 1939, but people discarded his classification. But, you know, our, our, our work basically shows that indeed these are four different species. And we have used morphological data, molecular data, and ecological data to to come up with uh, this new classification, well, the, to confirm Hill's classification. Uh, and the genus Semnopithecus now has six species, four Hanuman langurs, you know, or, or species that were previously assigned under Hanuman langur. And of course, Nilgiri langur and purple faced langur is also in Semnopithecus. Okay. Um, now, what is uh, <clears throat> interesting is this overall this result has interesting uh, implications for conservation if you look at the older classification scheme hanuman langur was distinct different from the rest all the other species were in trachypithecus now we know that these three species are in semnopithecus in fact hanuman langur has been split further into four species. Captain golden langur is again a different genus and the rest are in Trachypithecus. Right? So in India today we have these three distinct lineages. 
this one here is the only trachypithecus in India, right? Fairy sleeve monkey. This lineage here represents the captain golden langur, which has hybrid origin. And the rest is all Semnopithecus, which has which consists of five species, uh, which would actually be in India four plus one five. Yeah. But if you include Sri Lankan fairy sleeve uh, monkey or fairies, I'm sorry, not fairies, purple faced langur, then it could be six. Uh, so if you look at look at uh, this phylogeny, you realize that for India, the the genus of highest importance is probably this, because in this genus only we have only one species from this genus, fairy sleeve monkey, right from Trachypithecus, whereas Semnopithecus we have five species. Uh, in case of this hybrid lineage, we have two species at least, right? So, if in, in terms of taxonomic uniqueness, you know, which is an important parameter used to rate species for conservation access of uh, uh, action, uh, one scores them depending on how many species there are in the in the genus and I'm not going to get into the detail. Basically, if you have many species in the genus, then the taxonomic uniqueness of that species goes down, right? So the taxonomic uniqueness of this, um, of, 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 of species in Semnopithecus would be very low, followed by this lineage, followed by Trachypithecus. Remember, Trachypithecus is a very common genus in Southeast Asia. So the taxonomic uniqueness uh, for Trachypithecus, uh, any species in Trachypithecus in Southeast Asia will be much lower. But for, for India, it's important because there's only one species in that genus that we have here in India. So uh, or did UD had, had come up with, uh, you know, uh, the <clears throat> uh, taxonomic uniqueness scores for different species and and basically you know she was uh, she she came up with the uh, high score for hanuman langur right followed by nilgiri langur and and so on uh, captain golden langur didn't receive a very high score neither did fairies right but if you now look at now this was based on the fact that Hanuman Langur was a single species in a monotypic genus Semnopithecus right but now we know that Semnopithecus has at least five species in India and what we have to be really be concerned about is fairies Langur because that's the only Trachypithecus we have in India so I would assign a much higher score for fairy slango. Okay, um, so it turns out um, so we were talking about species complex. So what we were calling uh, Hanuman langur is a species com uh, complex uh, consisting of at least four species. And turns out, you know, there are many species complexes in India. And uh, here are some other examples, and I have. I have uh, written a review paper on this too so you can go take a look um, so we started with Semnopithecus we thought it, there was only three species and uh, now we know there are six uh, and uh, that's based on traditional taxonomy this is based on integrative taxonomy in almost every group there has been a huge increase in the number of species after uh, people started uh, using integrative taxonomic approach to look at the actual diversity. Now, this has very, very important implications for uh, for conservation, for for research, and so on. Uh, the most important thing is widely distributed species might be species complex, right? If you look at India, and if you have a species that is distributed across India. India is a vast country and you know that climatically things are so different in different parts of India. 
So everything, uh, a species that has such a wide distribution is unlikely to be a single species because, because the conditions are so different. Uh, and with Hanuman Langur, we knew that, uh, we have come to know that indeed it consists of multiple species. Uh, so if you consider Hanuman Langur as a single species and do comparative uh, work, then you run the risk of, of, of doing actually an uh, uh, interspecific comparison. Uh, but you think you are doing an intraspecific comparison. You are doing a comparison within species, but actually you are doing a across species comparison, right? So it's very important to resolve some of these issues. Um, <clears throat> other important uh, point here is that. So the other important point is that uh, taxonomy as a field has to evolve. Um, using morphology as the sole criteria for species dis uh, description is obsolete because you have cryptic species, you have, you know, very, very messy uh, situations like in case of Hanuman Langur where, you know, morphological characters have been pretty problematic in the past. Um, so one should be open to using acoustic, behavioral, anatomical, skeletal, chromosomal or molecular data um, to delimit species. <clears throat> the other important point, which uh, is uh, apparent from uh, the earlier slide, is that um, we are probably we have probably underestimated the diversity. So that's the situation here. So in almost every case, the number of species doubled, if not more, uh, with the with the application of uh, uh, integrative taxonomy. Uh, so I think this is uh, an important frontier in uh, biodiversity research, particularly in the tropics. Um, what groups should we target uh, when it comes to uh, cryptic species? vast majority of invertebrates, we have no clue what's going on. Uh, and also, you know, small, widely distributed vertebrates. So something really small, but which has a very wide distribution is probably a species complex. Right? Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, end the talk. And uh, these are some of the, the co-conspirators um, in this project. Um, Chetan Nag and uh, Asha Lakshmi did some of the earliest work on uh, on the genetics of Hanuman Langur, uh, as well as the morph. Chetan Nag did all the morphology, Asha Lakshmi the, the genetics. Um, and uh, Kunal has been working on the Himalayan Langurs. He also uh, did uh, an interesting project on um, the Captain Golden Langurs, uh, which we have just submitted. But the in the exciting news is just last week, uh, his work on the Himalayan langurs, Cystaceous, just got published. So we are very excited about it. Okay, so that is all I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope this was uh, useful. If you want to do this kind of research, uh, do get in touch with me. Uh, and I think uh, molecular approaches has huge, huge potential in, in primatology. Um, I've not talked about population genetics. Um, uh, it is another like at least 45 minute to an hour talk, um, you know, how molecular data can be used to understand very how variation is, uh, variation within a species is distributed in a population. Uh, or, or, or across the range of the species. Uh, and molecular tools can also be used uh, to understand, uh, you know, uh, primate behavioral ecology, right? Uh, unfortunately, in these areas, these other two areas, population genetics and behavioral ecology, not much uh, work has been done in India with respect to the use of molecular data. Um, but maybe in future, I will talk more about it. 
but that is all for now yeah thank you